Okay. The Pope met with his cardinals to discuss a proposal from Benjamin Netanyahu, if you know who that is, the leader of Israel. Your Holiness said one of the cardinals, Mr. Netanyahu, wants to challenge you to a game of golf to show the friendship and ecumenical spirit shared by the Jewish and Catholic faiths. The Pope thought it was a good idea, but he had never even held a golf club in his hand. He says, don't we have a cardinal who can represent me um, in this contest against the leader of Israel? He says, well, none that plays golf. Uh, a cardinal said, none that plays golf. But he added, there was a man named Jack Nicholas, an American golfer who was a devout Catholic. We can offer to make him a cardinal and then ask him to play Benjamin Netanyahu as your personal representative. In addition, uh, in addition to showing our spirit of cooperation, we'll also win the match. Everyone agreed it was a good idea. The call was made. Of course, Nicholas was honored and agreed to play. The day after the match, Nicholas reported to the Vatican to inform the Pope of the result. Your Holiness, said the golfer. Tell me the good news first, Cardinal Nicholas, Cardinal Nicholas, said the Pope. Well, Your Holiness, I don't like to brag, but even though I've played some pretty terrific rounds of golf in my life, this was the best I have ever played by far. I must have been inspired from above. My drives were long and true, my irons were accurate and purposeful, and my putting was, the perf was perfect. With all due respect, my play was truly miraculous. What's the bad news, the Pope asked. Nicholas sighed. He said, I lost to Rabbi Tiger Woods by three strokes. <laughs> Not a true story. <laughs> John chapter 15 starting with verse 12, 12 to 15 actually, but my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you as we look into these morsels of your word, that your Holy Spirit would ride these morsels into our hearts today and, and affect whatever changes in us that you would want it to do in Jesus' name, amen. So observe that he says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Observe that it's a command, it's not an observation, it's a command, which means you do it. Did you ever say that to your kids? That's a command, do this. <laughs> and you weren't kidding. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. We were created in the image of God. Part of that image is love. We're talking in, a, in anticipation of Valentine's Day today. It's a celebration of love. Part of our understanding of God is that love is of God. First John 4, 7 and 8, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. So I was placed on this earth and so were you, to worship God. We were placed on this earth to bring honor to our God. We were placed on this earth to glorify God. And he honors us by calling us friend. Isn't that awesome? The God of the universe calls us friends. It's personal. 
Most of us have a friend, maybe even more than one. It's a sad thing when someone has no friends. That's a sad thing. My sister had a friend that didn't exist. I guess that's a thing with little girls. You ever hear little girls having imaginary friends? Do you ever hear that? Did you ever have that when you were a little girl? <laughs> My sister had a friend, his name was Fred. And she was about maybe seven or eight years old. And my, I can remember my parents saying to her, how's Fred today? And she'd answer, he's okay. And Fred, you know, we're doing this or that. Fred was her, was her imaginary friend. But he didn't exist. But to her, he did. My first close friend, name was Gary. We are five years old. We were buddies. We did all kinds of things together. We never got in a whole lot of trouble together. I don't think. <laughs> went fishing together. We got a little older. We went hunting together. Went camping in, in the woods together. And uh, he was just my buddy. And then when he was about maybe, I don't know, 11 or 12, maybe, maybe younger than that, their family moved away to Kentucky. And we kept up by writing. We, we became pen pals, writing back and forth. Then they moved back to town. My old, my old buddy was my newfound buddy. And uh, he graduated from the public school and we graduated from the Catholic school. Actually, Gary dated Carol before I did. She was a social butterfly. She dated a lot of people. She was. She was drop dead gorgeous, I'm telling you. She was very attractive. But yeah, she was, she was with Gary for a little while. Once I got in there, you know, nobody else. <laughs> it was the end. But Gary was my buddy, and he saved my life twice. I was in a quarry. We used to go back in a quarry and look for fossils. And there was a cliff, and I thought, I can climb up that. And I got about three quarters of the way up there, and the top of it was crumbly. I thought I could take my little archaeology pick and make footholds and climb some more and I got stuck and Gary went up around there and there was an old uh, a dead fir tree and he threw that tree down over the quarry and went back around there was a path to go around and stood it up beside me and I got a hold of the tree and I got down he saved my life my buddy Gary did the next day we went back there again and I went back up on that and I heard him saying, you fool. <laughs> but this time I got almost to the top. I was about this far. And he got up on the top and laid down and got a hold of me and pulled me up over that cliff. Saved my life two days in a row. Because it's nothing but hard rocks if you fall. And I couldn't get back down. My buddy Gary Henry. Yep, my buddy. He was best man at our wedding. Don't see Gary very much, but he lives down in Virginia, but... Talk to him on a phone every couple of years. And then in California, we're talking about friends today. In California, I went to school out there to be, to be a photographer. I got a bachelor's degree in photography in Santa Barbara, California. And we had 50 in the class. And on the first day we had orientation and there was a break in mid morning. There was one black man in that class. Joe Moore was his name. So we had a, a, a break and guys were out there smoking and stuff. And I went over to Joe, he was standing by himself. And I said, my name's Lauren Woods, but my friends call me Woody. And he said, okay, Woody it is then. In other words, yeah, I'll be your friend. We were very close friends. I was the best man at his wedding, very close friends. He bought me my first taco and I didn't, didn't even know what a taco was. We were gonna go to a theater. And he, there were, the next one didn't start for a while. He said, let's go have a taco. I said, what's a taco? Back then, there weren't any tacos in Pennsylvania. We didn't know what tacos were. There was a Taco Bell around the house from where we lived, but I didn't know what taco. He said, come on, I'll treat you to your first taco. Talking about friendship today. I was a backslider for about three years, and when I came back to the Lord, there was a pastor there. His name was Tim Hull Foster, and um, he now pastors a, a, a large church in Enola, across the river from Harrisburg. 
very close friend, and he was preaching a sermon one day about um, about where he likes to go hunting in a northern county. So after church, I asked, and this is only, I was only there just two or three times. And I said, where do you go? He said, Potter County, that's my county. And I said, well, that's where I like to go fly fishing. He said, fly fishing? I want to learn how to be a fly fisherman. I said, I'm the guy who can teach you how to do that. So we, w we would go fly fishing. I would call ahead of time in Cross Fork, Potter County, and get a, and get a, a cabin. We'd leave after church on Sunday night, drive up in there, and I'd, we'd get up in the morning. I'd make breakfast. We'd go fishing and drive back. Taught Pastor Tim to fly fish. We'd become very good friends. Sometimes if I get stuck theologically, I'll call him. And uh, he's a Bible scholar, and he'll straighten me out. <laughs> Your friends will straighten you out. You know that if, you, if you're wondering but all of us need a friend, amen? My amen sign isn't working today because there was a buzz in my last two or three sermons and we're thinking that it was from the sign, so we don't know, we're, we're testing it out today. But we all need a friend. Amen. See, this will be my amen sign. We need somebody to talk to, somebody to confide in, someone that we can trust someone you can share your deepest feelings and concerns like your spouse your spouse ought to be your best friend best closest friend all of us should be a friend we need a friend but we should also be a friend you can fill a need in someone's life if you'll be their friend some people have a lot of friends some people have only a few friends and don't want any more. It's like us four and no more. Some people are that way, closed in. I remember when in a home church down there, we used to have a lot of uh, summer fellowships out in the pavilion. They have since closed that pavilion in and they use it for storage, but we used to have a lot of, they called it super summer Sunday nights and we had, so I would always, find a table with people that I didn't know very well and go and sit with them because then I get a new friend. If I just sit with my own people I'm familiar with all the time, well then I don't, I know, I already know you. <laughs> Let me sit with somebody I don't know. It's an awesome thing to make a new friend. We were coming back from vacation somewhere up in New York, I think, one day, and there was a there's a there's a ribs place up in Mill Hall, Kurt's Smoking Ribs, delicious ribs, man, delicious ribs. Anyway, he has an outside tent. He doesn't have like one table in in the in that place, but outside he has a tent with tables, and the tables were all full except for one. So we took that table. You get your you get your ribs. You go out and sit at the table, and another couple came, a young a, a black couple. I wouldn't say young, but same as age we were. And when they came out, there was no empty table. And I said, hey, come on, sit with us, you know? And I didn't know what, what, they, were, what they were, but she asked him to ask a blessing. And then I knew they were, I said, you're believers. Well, here she was a pioneer pastor starting a church in Williamsport. And she, and she wanted me to come preach for her. And I wanted to do that because to preach in a black church, that would have been so awesome. And she wrote my number down on a napkin and she must have thrown it away because I never heard from her again. But I was ready to be her friend. You know, I was, I was their friend right then. But Jesus is our ultimate friend. He did what he recommended he never says anything that he doesn't back up with his own actions. He is utterly dependable. He listens to our concerns. And people of our vintage have a lot of them. <laughs> we have a lot of them by this time. He's interested in all the details of our life. He really is a friend. He truly loves us. He's our ultimate friend. The, a powerful friendship 
The responsibility of friendship in Ruth, this is about Ruth now, Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. You're familiar with this scripture, I'm sure. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Verse 17, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Now, this was her mother-in-law she's talking to. Her husband, she's a widow. Her husband's died. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi, this is her mother-in-law, realized that, Doth, that, that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. She had been urging her to go back to her own people. But Ruth was an example of true friendship, true loving friendship. Ruth was a Moabitess. She was a member of the race of the Moabites. They were an accursed race. Moab and, and, and Ammon, his half-brother, were the product of incest between Lot and his daughters after the destruction of Sodom. They, they got their father, Lot, they got him drunk and they had sex with him and these, these two men um, were the result. So Ruth was born and raised in paganism. At this time, the priests of Moab were powerful and they were cruel and they served an assortment of gods. But the most feared god of all was Chemosh or Molech, which I believe is the same god as Baal. They worshiped in the same way. I think it was a demon, the same demon, I think. Chemosh had his terrible place on a platform of movable stones under which a great fire would be kindled. Chemosh's lap was so constructed that little children, infants, were placed on its red hot surface, would roll down an inclined plane into his fiery belly. That was the worship of Chemosh. Of, actually that's what they did to worship Baal too. They, they burned infants, alive infants, they burned alive. That's what they did. You can't explain that away. That's a fact. And Ruth knew about another god. Actually, a fertility goddess, Ashtoreth, Asherah to the to the people in the north of Israel who offered the Moabites regeneration through the gratification of lust with harlot priests, priestesses in the temple. They did the same thing in Baal's, where there, was a, where there was an altar to Baal, there was a shrine to Asherah or Ashtoreth. Different cultures, numerous different names, but so Ruth grew up a pagan in a land cursed by foulness and the ferocity of its gods. A land where human sacrifice and perversion was how they worshipped. This is the woman around whom the story in the book of Ruth evolves. The account tells how Ruth came to know the living God of Israel and how she entered the family of God through the redemptive act of a kinsman redeemer. If any book in the Bible demonstrates God's matchless grace and illustrates the divine plan of redemption, it is the book of Ruth. Ruth loved Naomi. Her love caused her to be a responsible friend. She felt responsible to go with Naomi they were going back to Israel to a culture she did not know. Totally different. I don't even know if she knew the language. But she was willing to embrace a totally different life situation, culture, 
for the sake of her friend, her mother-in-law, whom she loved. A true friend accepts differences. She was a different person. They accepted each other, totally different cultures, different race of people, different heritages. But a true friend accepts differences. Joe Moore was a black man. He was my buddy, my closest buddy. He was best man at his wedding. True friend realizes that one person's weakness is another person's strength. True friend finds ways to get along with someone who's different from you. Who's different from you, has different ideas, different thoughts. But a true friend finds a way to get along with people who are not the same as you. True friend finds something to love in someone who's unlike you, who you might think is not lovable. But a true friend finds something to love in a person. A true friend forgives. A true friend overlooks offenses. You ever offend anybody accidentally? <laughs> Don't put your hand up. But you would forgive that if you want to be that person's real friend. A true friend respects each other. A true friend loves. Joe Moore, the black man, brought me to where he worshiped. It was a temple, it was a Hindu temple. I went there for two years. And that was, that was what I believed for two years. And he brought me to that, introduced me to it. I forgive you, Joe. <laughs> you can still be my friend. Every now and then I have to call him up. And he lives in California. His wife is a retired black history professor, Dr. Shirley Moore. But anyway, Carol and I are blessed to have so many friends. Real, godly friends. People who rally around us in a hard time. When she had a stroke, they were coming out of the woodwork. They really were, they were coming out of the woodwork, calling, find out how she's doing, bringing meals over, dropping food off at the house. She didn't get to enjoy the food because she was in the hospital and in the rehab, but I enjoyed, they, were, they brought me so much food I had to freeze it. And then when she came home, I'd thaw it out and then she'd get to enjoy it. Carol was on three church prayer chains, including this one. We have a very loving relationship with so many people wherever we have been in churches. The love of the Lord comes forth. The prayers of real godly friends have touched us powerfully. And she has had a remarkable improvement. Amazing improvement. Then she fell on the steps and broke her back in three places back in the hospital, then back in the rehab, people praying, and she's okay. I don't know if she could jump rope. She probably wouldn't try that, would she? No, she probably, probably couldn't do that. And Ruthie kicked a basket down the stairs in her house and fell down and contacted every step as she was going down the steps. She came in here with a black eye, but the people of God prayed for her. She doesn't have a black eye anymore. And she doesn't kick laundry baskets anymore. Well, maybe she does. I don't know. Probably not. Friends, godly friends, ultimate thing. That's the love of God flowing through each other. When somebody's hurting, we feel it. We pray for them earnestly. Even though this is a small church, the advantage of a small church is you can know where everybody hurts in a big church with 200 people, you can't really know unless they make it known. That's why they have small groups in the bigger churches. They have little small groups, they call them, care groups. And you join one of those and you have a meeting once a, once a week or every other week. And then you share your needs with them and they know about it and they call you. And they, it's the same, it's, you know, it's like that. We, we had that in our house down there. 
We had a black lady that would come. She, she came to church. Nobody knew her. And nobody, she came to the altar. The first time she was ever there, she came to the altar and knelt down. And nobody went anywhere near her. That shouldn't happen. And, and I started over to pray with her. I wasn't a minister at that time. And I started over and somebody else uh, got a hold of me and wanted me to pray for them. Actually, who that was was your sister-in-law. <laughs> your, uh, you know who I mean. Hmm? Wendy and Gerald and Eric. I think his name was. Anyway, that's who they got, in, in, and I prayed for them. And then by that time, she got up and she was on her way down the aisle. I chased her down. I chased after her. I said, "Hey, wait a minute! You wanted prayer." I said, I'll, "I'd be happy to pray with you." What's going on? She says, "I just got here and I'm overwhelmed." And she just was moving, and she needed a church, and she needed Christian friends. I said, "Come on down to the altar." I knelt, knelt down with her and prayed with her. We became really friends. She came to our. We had one of those. Uh, one of those meetings every other week, I guess it was. We had one of those at our house, small group we call them. And she came, and she would be tired, and she sat in the recliner, and she would fall asleep during the lesson. My wife put a blanket on her, <laughs> and she slept because she was secure in a loving home. We cared about her so much, you know. Her sister is still there in that church, down the home church. Her, she moved away. I think she went to Baltimore. Where did she go? Somewhere. And, uh, but anyway, she had a, a master's degree in business, business administration. So, and her husband was retired from the Navy. So where she went um, to a university, and that was her past experience before she came to Altoona, she was a, 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 a purchasing agent in a university, and she got a job just like that. And so they left, but her sister still goes to that church down there. Talking about friendship today, you can't, you can't have a friendship without loving. I don't think you can have a friendship without loving. But the love of the Lord comes forth. The prayers of real godly friends will touch a person powerfully. Jesus is the ultimate friend. We think of him as our king. We think of him as our master. We think of him as our Lord, and that's what he is. But he thinks of us as his friends. Once we're born again, he calls us friends. And that separates us from the rest of the world. We are the friends of God. Jesus would like everyone to be his friend, but sadly, most reject him. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In other words, many will have head knowledge of him, but never take the step of receiving him into their life as Lord and Savior. They never come to repentance thinking that they can go on living as they please without regard for the will of God. But there's a change that takes place when you come to Christ as Lord and Savior. There's a change that takes place. Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. That's one of the tragedies of life, that most are on the broad path and only a few turn off and go God's way. The few who find it are a precious few indeed, and they are the friends of God. 
2 Peter 3, 8 and 9, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. So the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's God's desire for all people to come to repentance and to be born again. The promise of God to those who love him, to his friends, in Psalm 91 says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. In verse 15, he will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Jesus wants everyone to be his friend. He is the friend that the Bible says sticks closer than a brother. Jesus set the standard for great friendship. Greater love has no man than he that lays down his life for his friend. So the question is, do you have it in you to love the unlovable? To God, there is no such thing as unlovable. The ones that are outside of God have a potential to be loved by God, to be loving people for God. It's easy to love people that you know. But when you encounter someone new, somebody you don't know, somebody you never met, do you judge to see if they measure up to the standards, to your standards for friendship? You have to examine your heart and see if that's true. What if they smoke? Can they still be your friend? What if they don't like the Steelers? Can they still be your friend? What if they don't go fishing? And don't like it. Can they still be your friend? What if they have an accent? You can't understand what they're saying. Can they be your friend? What if their complexion is different from yours? Can they still be your friend? What if they're in a different political party? Can they still be your friend? What if they're unbelievers? Being a friend to an unbeliever can lead to their conversion. Should we stay away from people that aren't believers? We should cultivate them because we might be able to convert them. We could be the one whose love for them turns them around. We've had many such experiences that. If they don't like the Steelers, you know what? I don't even know who's in the Super Bowl. Once the Steelers are out of it, I don't care. I don't pay any attention. I'm not watching it. I don't care. It doesn't matter anymore. But being a friend to an unbeliever can lead to their conversion. If you go out of your way to be friendly and, and show your love to them, when they get into some kind of trouble or get in a quiet time when they start wondering about God, there's an opening for you to lead them to Christ. Lead them to the Lord and then bring them to church. We got room for them in here. That's true. Is there room in your heart and in your life for a new friend? I like to make new friends. I really do. I walked up to a table in a restaurant we were at. I walked up a table full of black people. Full of black people. And I said hello to them. And I said, I should have sat at this table. And one guy says, why? He said, I said, because then I get a new friend. And they said, amen. They were, they were believers. I know the church. I know the church where they, uh, where they go. The, the missionary uh, mount. Uh, I forget the first part of it, but it's a missionary Baptist church. It's a black Baptist church. Beautiful people. And one of them is a friend of mine. I've never, we've never, 
hung out with them, her and her husband, but because it just doesn't work out. We still will, though, but I, I, I ask her to, to pray for me at different times. And she doesn't, she said, she works in, the, in, the, in a giant eagle supermarket, and um, she can't do that right then, but she'll pray for me later, and the next day I'm healed, really healed. Usually it's from gout, but I'll ask her to pray for me. She says, consider it done. I was in an antique store down in Bedford. No, where was it? Was that where was that? Was it in Bedford? <laughs> where were we? I can't remember. Evansburg. Evansburg. We were in an antique store, and uh, that's what we do. We go to antique stores, and there was a painting about a 16 by 20 size painting. It was just a print of a of a printing, it was entitled, um, oh man, I should have written this down. What was the great, what was the great, uh, she knew right away who I was talking about. Anyway, she led the slaves on the, she was a slave and she escaped and she came north and she led slaves out of bondage. And there was a painting depicting her and some slaves behind her in a, in a building and they were getting out of bondage. What, what was her name? <laughs> I didn't intend to talk about this so I didn't write it down here. And I don't remember anything very well. But she's a, she was a famous, a famous uh, person. So I bought that picture. It was in a frame. Harriet. Harriet. Yeah. Tubman. Tubman. Harriet Tubman, thank you. I don't have to remember. I got remembers for me here. Harriet Tubman, this, this picture, he painted that. And so I bought it. I thought, I bet, I bet my friend, this lady in the store, her name is Dancy. And uh, I thought, I bet she would like that. So the next day I took it up. I went up to the store and she was in the, she's in the customer service. I said, I have this painting. And I said, it's of Harriet Tubman. It's, it's, it's entitled Harriet, Harriet Tubman. Um, I don't even remember what the rest of the title was. But anyway, she, knew, she wasn't familiar with the painting. She didn't know about it. And I said, would you like it? She said, well, how much is it going to cost? I said, nothing. I said, I bought it for my friend. And, um, and I said, it wasn't expensive anyway. But So I brought it in. And she, when she saw it, her, she just lit up, you know. She thought it was so awesome. And it was. It really was. But you do something for, for a friend. Someday we're going to have them over. We just keep trying. But um, I have to just go out of my way to do something to bless somebody. There's a, guy that, there's a guy that works as a cashier in that same store. And I was there one day and he's pulling his pants up. Pulling his pants up. I was there another time and he was doing the same thing. I said, you need some suspenders. Yeah, he says, I'll have to go out and look around. So I went and got him a pair. These kind of suspenders right here. Oh, I don't have them on today. <laughs> they don't clip on because those, the, those kind of clip on. I was preaching a sermon one time. I dropped something on the floor. I bent over, the clip let go, and the suspenders hit me in the back of the head. So these have a plastic thing that hooks over your belt. And, and you can't find those in a store anymore. You have to get them online. So I said, I'll get, I, I'll get you a pair of those. He said, and, uh, he said, well, let me know how much. And um, I just dropped those off in the service. I said, give these to Denny. And when he asks me about it, I'm saying, I'm just being a blessing. I just like to do that. Do you like to do that? Unexpected gift to somebody? Just, I, just, I just love to do that. Is there, is there room in your heart? And in your life, for a new friend, for a new friend. Someone out there might need you. Someone you don't know, a stranger, might need a friend. And becoming a friend with you, they might become a friend of God. Take that with you. Take that with you today. You can be a friend of a stranger. And in becoming your friend, that might lead them to becoming a friend of God, a born-again believer. Amen? Take that with you today. Would you stand?
How many are watching football today? <laughs> I'm not. I don't care about it. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. when the Steelers are out, I'm out. I don't care. I hope nobody gets hurt. You know. But anyway, I'll find something else to do. Make some flies, maybe. Um, I, I know that. I do know that. Yeah. 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 They're very young to be that good. <laughs> yeah. But you can't be a judge. Just be a friend. Amen. You don't have to draw a line and say, I'm not going to be a friend to a person that has an accent that I can't understand. I'm not going to be a friend to a person that's black or brown. I'm going to be your friend. I'm going to be. Or arms open. I'm going to be anybody's friend that will have me. And that might lead to somebody being saved that wouldn't otherwise have been, you know? Anyway, Father God, we thank you today for this church and the believers in this church and also for every person on these believers' hearts. We all have family and friends that are not saved. We all have friends like that, Lord. So we ask that you, know, that you impress upon us to be, to be a friend of God and to share that friendship with other people. We thank you today for every, just every person in here, Lord, and the people that's on their hearts. And we just pray, Lord, as this day goes on that no one gets hurt in the game. And um, pray that it'll be safe and uh, enjoyable for all those who want to enjoy it. And... Um, and have their parties and their snacks. We pray that you will just bless that event and uh, your people. And go with, go with each of us now and bring us back together safely next time we meet in Jesus' name. Amen.